I have the privilege of being the interviewer of Gerald Friedman. Oh. <laughs> And uh, ah, well, that's good. And I'll sit over here and let you be center stage, as you deserve to be. Uh, Jerry, um, before we talk about West Side Story, I I'd like to ask you how you came to know Jerome Robbins. Well, um, my, my young career led me out to uh, uh, Columbia Pictures. I was under contract to Columbia in, in Hollywood. And uh, one of the first pictures I worked on was uh, It Should Happen to You with Judy Holliday. And uh, Adolph Green and, and uh, Betty Comden were writing a show for her with Julie Stein. The bells are ringing. And uh, Judy came to uh, trust me in terms of observing her work and telling me, was this good, was this bad, was this truthful or not? We had a, a wonderful uh, relationship that just grew out of doing that picture. By the way, Jack Lemon was in that picture, and Jack and I came out to Hollywood together uh, at that time for to Columbia Pictures. And then uh, they, they uh, Common and Green wrote uh, Bells Are Ringing for Judy, and Jerome Robbins was going to direct it, and it was his first really directing assignment. He had stage, was known as a magnificent stager and of course a great choreographer. Uh, Judy was a little leery about his working with him as a director for actors. And um, she said, I, I want you to be on the show. And so when I said, what can I, you know, what am I supposed to? Well, you could be the stage manager. I said, I'm not a stage manager. I'm, I'm a director. And uh, she then introduced me to Jerome Robbins and uh, out in Hollywood. They, they were uh, looking for uh, the leading man who turned out to be Sid, Sidney Chaplin for it. And um, Jerry Robbins, I think, was intimidated by Judy Holiday of a group of uh, artists, great artists, uh, Leonard Bernstein, Jerry Robbins, uh, I don't know, some other, uh, Betty, uh, Betty and Adolph, uh, Common and Green. Uh, Judy was like the star, uh, not because she was a diva, but because they all respected her talent and her fabulous sense of truthful acting and, uh, and game playing. They all loved to play games, word games, um, were, were the th that's how I really came to uh, familiar with Judy Holiday. Th listen, this goes back a little bit. I was, <laughs> no, I was, I was out in, in the studio pick and I was whistling, whistling uh, the prelude, uh, uh, Gershwin's second piano prelude. And she poked her, her head out of the trailer and said, who's doing that? And I thought, oh my God, you're not supposed to whistle in a studio or a backstage. And she said, come in here. And I thought, well, this is the end of my career. I was just beginning. <clears throat> and she said, Why, what were you whistling? And I said, well, Gershwin's second piano prelude. She said, come in here. And that began our friendship. <clears throat> And um, she was brilliant, wasn't she? Because even though she, even though she won the Academy Award for playing the dumb blonde uh, in yeah. Born Yesterday, she was actually brilliant. Wait, she introduced me to Jerry, and Jerry, I'd say, was intimidated by Judy, and he thought, "Hey, Friedman would be good insurance." And it turned out I could do a little tap dancing, I could sing, I was musical, and uh, she, you know, respected my my acting uh, coaching, and so that's how I came to know Jerome Robbins. Your acting coaching, let me take you back even further. Um, how did you study acting and the techniques of acting? Because that's actually a good story for people to understand where, where this all goes to. Well, I, <laughs> that's, that's hard to say. I had a great mentor named Alvina Krauss at Northwestern University. And I didn't go to Northwestern to be in the theater. I went there to get an education. And I got into theater because I was a painter. And I got into the scene shop and painting and everything. And slowly that led me to uh, a director where I could put my musical talent, my whatever intellect I possessed, and, uh, uh, every, and, and everything came together as a director. And uh, this great mentor, uh, Alvina Krauss, who, whose way of teaching, which was based on the Stanislavski method, I am still perpetuating yes, at I was North say Carolina that. School of the Arts. Yeah, right. It's a, it's a method that goes back to Stanislavski yeah, and, with one. And, uh, and just one's you know, natural instinct. One thing I must say that Jerry kept on saying about my work, which uh, it has, he said, Jerry, you have tremendous clarity and a tremendous sense of truth, uh, which always moved me very much. 
coming from Jerry, who also had a great, great sense of truth. Whatever stories you may read about his uh, tyrannic methods and his genius as a choreographer, behind it was uh, uh, an obsession with truthful dance, truthful whatever, uh, the emotional life of it. And then he coupled with Leonard, who had that same obsession, and with Arthur Lawrence. They all three shared this extraordinary uh, obsession, I have to repeat the word again, of, of truth in art. And that was, I think, the basis of West Side Story. And, well, and it was necessary for me to uh, you know, come along with that. Well, from Bells Are Ringing, which obviously you were successful at and the show was a huge success, where does that take us to West Side Story? And when did you get that? Well, I had, a, I had a seven year contract with the Columbia Pictures. And after Bells Are Ringing, I had to go back and uh, fulfill my contract. And I, then I got a wonderful telegram, uh, which my mother kept in a scrapbook. And it said, um, how soon can you get here and what do you want? <laughs> Well, one thing that I wanted that I couldn't get was billing at mm -hmm. <laughs> Jerome Robbins. <laughs> no matter how much he wanted me to work on the show, he wasn't willing to give me billing. Uh, but what was uh, wonderful about uh, working on, on West Side was uh, they were really all dancers. I mean, that was what the, the talent. Amongst the dancers were... Uh, a few people who could sing magnificently, one of them being Carol Lawrence, who is here right now. And uh, some of them had, well, they all had performing talent. Cheetah was, had been a, a feature performer. Carol uh, had been uh, in, in shows on, in Broadway. And, and Mickey, who, who was sitting there, had, had, was at the beginning of his career. But they all had wonderful starts, beginnings on, on Broadway, but really not a lot of acting experience. They, they had talent, they had souls. That was mostly, and uh, so my job was, how do you help them toward truthful acting? And one of the stories Arthur put in his book, uh, and, and he, he meant it in a pejorative way. Um, there were, uh, Carol Lawrence, Larry Curt, and I were working on the balcony scene. And there was some, they, they, the performing instinct was so strong in them. Uh, it was uh, it was hard to get rid of that in a sense, uh, and and of course you didn't want to get rid of it because that finally was part of their charisma. But how do you get them not to think about performing? So there were many things that we did. One of the things I did was finally remove myself from the rehearsal studio, and just have Carol and Larry by themselves. I thought, well, who are they going to perform for? I, I'm not there, but I was listening. <laughs> I was listening, and that helped. It helped that they were doing the balcony scene only for each other, and they got in touch with what does that mean, just to relate to each other and not perform for me, even though I was the director and saying, don't perform, don't perform. So, and that was the, the tough part of uh, coaching uh, in West Side Story. They were all... Uh, it, it, uh, Grover Dale sitting here with Snowboy. I don't know what, what acting experience you had before, but they all, could, they all had charisma. That's why they were chosen it, amongst the hundreds of auditioners for this uh, uh, demanding work. But very few of them had real uh, acting experience. And so how do you get them really to talk, not perform, not just do lines? Uh, that was the task. And... Uh, there were many wonderful stories, and when, when I get them up there, I, I hope they'll, they will tell some. I'm sure they will. But yeah. one that... Uh, <laughs> They're dying to right now. They're practically yeah. chewing at but the edge of the stage. But one that I remember, and, and that Cheetah often tells, she's put it in her act, uh, was working on A Boy Like That with Carol and Cheetah. And uh, it, you know, it was wonderful. They were acting the pants off it and singing uh, the opera out of it, as it were. But it was not meaningful. And in ways I awakened in them what in Stanislavski terms you call substitution or personalization. I asked uh, Cheetah, think, who, who do you love? Who's close to you? And she said, oh, I know. Well, you, anyway, she, her brother. And when she began to personalize and uh, substitute her brother for uh, Bernardo, 
it broke through, uh, broke through her performing sense. And that changed her, and, and she says it often. Uh, and that kind of breaking through a performer to the truth is what really acting is all about. Um, and it happens at different times for different people. And uh, both Carol, because she's sitting here, and, and Cheetah, who is on the coast, doing her one-woman show. She wanted to be here very badly, but uh, couldn't be. Uh, they went on to be great actors. Let's talk for a moment about Arthur Lawrence, who uh, was supposed to be here and just had an eye operation and uh, it, it can't, is not allowed to travel. And Jerry spoke to him just the other day, and he's devastated that he can't be here. But he had, because he had two operations, that meant that his head has to stay immobile at a certain angle and he couldn't fly here anyway. But, the, but let me ask you about, about Arthur for a minute because as some of you know, Arthur received an honorary doctorate here last year. He spoke to the students um, and uh, about West Side Story. Um, one of the things that has been a discovery for me in working on West Side Story for the first time as, as a music director is, is his genius. And, and, and it goes into two ways. One, uh, he, the starting off point is Romeo and Juliet, but it veers way away from Romeo and Juliet. That, and the decision was made not to have a sleeping potion, not to have both of them die at the end. I don't want to give away the end of West Side Story. For those of you who might be seeing it for the first time. But, but that, that is, is brilliant. And the other thing is that he invents a language. Well, I, I talked to Arthur yesterday, and I asked him some questions uh, about uh, the, the libretto. This term, we did a, a production, of, a very ingenious and wonderful production of Romeo and Juliet, uh, directed by a, a former, a, a, an alum and a former student of mine named John Legs. It was very creative and very inventive. <laughs> and I, I would go from rehearsing West Side Story to observe John's rehearsals of Romeo and Juliet, they said, wait a minute. Wait, I've just been here, right? Say, I, yes, I've just <laughs> We been all here. did that. <laughs> but when I asked Arthur, there were several things. Uh, John Malcherry remarked the other uh, day, when did they decide that uh, Juliet shouldn't die, Maria Juliet? And I asked Arthur that, and he said, well, Jerry Robbins wanted her to die. He wanted her to take sleeping pills <clears throat> and, and fade away. And Arthur says, it's impossible. She's too vibrant. She's too full of life. She's living for him. And so uh, Maria lived. Juliet died. Uh, that was one thing. Uh, oh, then great. I asked him about his street language. Uh, cut the frabba jabba. Right. Uh, rigga tigga tum tum. I said, where, where did that come from? He said, well, I, he said, I, I don't know where it came from. But you, I didn't want to use actual street language because it would eventually date the material. And he said, it was a matter of your ear of his ear, I mean just making it up. And so it, he himself kind of didn't know where it came from, but he knew he didn't want to uh, use street language. The one thing he said he used was the word cool. And he said, I knew it would still be valid. <laughs> How fantastic. <laughs> that he is now I think he, now that I cool, the word cool has changed, but it is still valid. Yeah. And it means different things, but it's still in, in our linguistic you know, lexicon. One of the things that was clear to me in, in the first readings of the script, uh, Arthur's book, um, was the residue of the East Side Story version of West Side Story, which is to say an Italian gang and uh, a Jewish gang, whatever that would be. But, um, uh, <laughs> I our, our, so I suppose uh, Mao Cherry and Friedman, that's the two gangs right here on the stage. What is funny is there is a residue of that. When you think about the Jets, when they say, you're a family man, huh? You know, your own, it, you could talk to it like uh, Tony Soprano, and some of those scenes could be taken like that, and you could talk like that. At the same time, the Puerto Rican scenes, there's a scene as a tonight's my last night is a blonde, no loss. Again, it could be completely Jewish. It's like two yentas. Uh, and, and, and you could actually do West Side Story. You could just read it with the other accents, and there's some residue. Yeah. 
On the other hand, one of the main achievements of West Side Story, which would be absolutely not replicable today, is that not a single bad word is said. Think about it. The, the worst word is crap. I beat the crap out of you. It's a shock. You know, it's, it, it is amazing that Krupke goes through the whole scene, Krup you, you have, you bet your A, you know, you wise apples. Words that represent other words that we absolutely know. And if you were to write West Side Story today, you would have to write it in an entirely different way. And the profanity would go right from the very first line of, of the show. And there's no profanity. And you, you completely get into it and accept it. You accept this language that was, that's all metaphors of, of the real words. And that is an amazing achievement that, that Arthur can... The two things. When the story changes, and I can remember as an 11-year-old being totally surprised by the twists and turns of Act 2. Because remember, at Act 1, which is twice as long as Act 2, there are two dead bodies on the stage. And really, basically, this, the story could almost end there. And the fact that Maria and Anita are alive at the end makes me, and I, I know this is, this is the question I would ask Arthur if he were sitting here, who would they be today? Because just as, as Mr. Flores was talking, you have to understand that the real Maria and the real Anita would be in their 70s and living somewhere. Maybe they went back to Puerto Rico. Maybe they're living in the South Bronx. Maybe, and we'll talk about this later with Carol because she said something to me earlier that I never knew about how she played the last scenes. And, but, but consider that. And also what Juan Flores said about the Cape Man. The Cape Man, the musical by Paul Simon with Mark Antony playing the Cape Man is, is an incredibly interesting work and one which sadly did not succeed but includes some of the best music that Paul Simon ever wrote. And it's a pity that we don't have a way to compare the two because in fact it was issues like that that inspired uh, West Side Story and the believability of it. But Jerry, let me ask you this. When you were working on this show, wh what was the feeling? Because no one had ever done anything like this. I mean, yes, Tobacco Road and those shows which were depressing, depression era plays, but a musical. Was there a sense uh, that you were insulated from the Broadway community or were people telling you, gosh, it's going to be great? Or were they telling you, boy, you're in a, a, a flop? How, how can you spend so much time on it? Well. Uh, this was my impression, and maybe the performance we're in will give uh, different uh, uh, ideas about it. But uh, Leonard Bernstein, Jerry Robbins, Arthur Lawrence were so respected and elevated in the theater community as special artists uh, and uh, geniuses. And we can say that, we don't use the word that often, but obviously your history has borne that out. We all wanted to be part of it. And I don't think anybody questioned. You didn't think about, oh, this will make me a star or, or this will be good for my career. It was something challenging to work on that we had never worked on. And that's the way I felt about it at any rate. I would have, I, I felt so honored to be asked. Not because, uh, you know, it was going to get me anywhere, but because it was going to be an absolutely unique work. Now, I was already working, you know, with Shakespearean text and what have you. Uh, this this had that kind of integrity about it, and it helped focus just on the property because nobody thought of it as a career uh, move, and, and including I think uh, uh, the creators. And and uh, this is my impression too. When I don't, uh, the Bobby Griffiths and Hal Prince, they had two enormous uh, successes, uh, Pajama Game and Damn Yankees, and they were out of town with. Uh, New Girl in Town. And my impression was they wanted to legitimize themselves. They wanted to say to the community, we, 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 we really can produce art. So nobody really thought this was going to be a commercial success. But it, they knew it was going to be, quotes, art. Uh, because of you know Jerry's quote about the ballet, opera, and what have you. I think it came as a great surprise to us that in Washington, where the first started, that People were, went berserk about it. That was so great. And as a matter of fact, the typical thing happened. Uh, the next morning, after wonderful reviews in Washington, they decided to write another number for Baby John, Arab, and anybody's, because they were obviously really uh, audience pleasers. So the, the, the old habit 
of revising, you know, rewriting something, or writing something immediately for the audience. Couldn't be stopped. And it was written, and we rehearsed it, and everybody looked around after the number was on stage, not in rehearsal, and said, no. And they took it out, and the show remained what it had been. Well, I'm seeing two Bernsteins standing there going, what number is this number? That's the, Sid, do you remember this number? No. Well, it wasn't orchestrated, because it was uh, a, a piano. I mean, it was rehearsed in piano. Kid Stuff, it was called. Look at that. Good Who said that? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Kid Stuff. What? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's in the biography of Robbins. Um, well, wait, let's, find, let's find the music. Kid Stuff. It must be at the library. That's fantastic. I think well, I... It's like the overture issue. You know, the show never had an overture, and, and uh, only later, only later was an overture added for a revival because it was felt that audiences wanted to hear the tunes. But we, we begin the show as it was written in 57. John, I want to say a few more things about sure. Arthur's book. please. And, and how he changed it. Uh, I asked him about this. In Shakespeare's play, there are three scenes about uh, a man named Paris who Juliet is meant to marry. Uh, and they're not really very good scenes, but they're, they're, they, they help move the plot along. In West Side Story, uh, uh, Maria says to uh, Anita, right in the first scene, in the first scene, uh, for what did my fine brother bring me here? He says, to marry Chino. In one line, they got the plot done. <laughs> one line. Now, I'm not... God forbid, I'm not denigrating Shakespeare. My, <laughs> but in converting, Arthur was so inventive in so many ways that he is not given credit for. And when I talked to him yesterday, he said, you know, there, there can't be anything in the music. You can't move it ahead unless it's emotional. So he got ripped, but you have to tell the plot. You have to get a story. He did it in one word. Well, he does that just before a boy like that. In act two, it's the most amazing moment, the most amazing moment when Anita comes in, looks at the bed, and, and uh, Maria says, now you know, and then Anita says, and, and you don't know that he is one of them. You still don't know. Yeah. There you go, line. Song. I what? mean, when she comes in the door, discovering the bed, I'm, so, I'm, I'm ready for you know, a seven minute scene before I have to conduct again, and I know that I have to keep standing up there, waiting and looking at the three bass clarinets, thank you. Sid, um, I mean, in the history of orchestration, we'll talk about this later, that, this, that, that, that song is three bass clarinets and a bassoon, unprecedented. And we're gonna talk about the sound of West Side Story later. But it is, it is brilliant, and in all of our rehearsals, the one thing that Jerry has insisted on is that the importance of every line. There is not a single line in, that, in the play of West Side Story that's irrelevant or can be thrown away, and that is, and you'll notice that tonight. It's, it's completely extraordinary that the plot is moved forward. And, and in Lenny's music, he always allows the space in the underscoring for the moment when it's absolutely essential. We haven't seen Tony for a month. You know, Tony, who needs Tony? Q, da gung, da gung, da gung, da gung. And then you hear, Tony and I started the Jets. The space is there for us to understand the importance of that moment. So as the plot, as the information is being given to you at the very beginning of West Side Story, you're getting it and it's being linked to the melodies of Tony, of the Jets, and uh, the, it, it is completely extraordinary. There are a couple of other things. Ar Arthur uh, said yesterday, you know, that in Romeo and Juliet, the Montagues and Capulets are equals, uh, two noble houses. But the thing that gets West Side Story is they're not equal, as F uh, Mr. Flores made us scare. They're deprived, they're, uh, uh, and they're, th they're threatened. So right from the beginning, you, you again set a plot in motion that is emotional, not, not uh, circumstantial. Right, because you have two noble houses in yeah. Romeo and Juliet, and so they're not like us. They are separate, so they become like the gods, and so you experience that almost the way you would with a Greek situation where we're just regular people and those are the kings and queens. In this case, these are people who are deprived. There's another wonderful uh, indication of their collaboration. Uh, 
Shakespeare has this wonderful sonnet on the meeting of uh, Romeo and Juliet, and it starts out this way. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this. And he goes on, to, uh, and, and she says, good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much. Well, that became what we call the cha-cha, and it's all about hands. Uh, Jerry choreographed hands intertwining, and the words are, your, your, my hands are cold. Your hand. So they took that element of hands and converted it into this totally unique and original ballet uh, libretto music combination that carries the essence of Shakespeare's magnificent uh, sonnet, and yet it, it, it is, is totally a musical term. Yeah, it's wordless. It's a wordless sonnet, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in working on it again now, you, Jerry, you, you worked on, obviously, the first production. We talked about that. And on the London production? Well, I, I coached, I, I prepared the London production uh, with uh, George Shakiras, who played Bernardo in the movie, as Riff. Right. And he had no idea of how to I, I, be on a stage, I, I don't think. But it was interesting to me that he played Riff and then became Bernardo. And uh, I pre prepared, or I directed a city center production before the 1980 revival, which got the, the first really unreservedly good reviews uh, was the city center. Pro and there was a great uh, young woman named Julia McGinnis who became an international uh, opera star. And can you believe this, Juan? This has everything to do with your... I called up Hal Prince. Now, this was in the early 60s. And I said, Hal, this wonderful girl came in. She's, she is Maria. I mean, she can sing like a goddess, and she can actually dance and act. But she's Puerto Rican. <laughs> and I kind of felt I had to ask Hal can I cast a Puerto Rican As a in Puerto a Puerto Rican. Rican role? Right. That's what the theater was like then. I'd also like to point out about what Cheetah said is that the two smartest people in, in, in the play are the two Puerto Rican women. The guys are basically, you know, jerks, and as guys are <laughs> on both sides. But the two really smart ones, even though they get sucked into something that they will never get out of, um, are the two women, and they're both Puerto Rican. Um, but let's talk about the reviews for a moment. Uh, we like to, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of West Side Story, and we could be celebrating the 50th anniversary of The Music Man, which ran the same year and won most of the Tony Awards. Um, Music Man is a great, great show. Um, and one of the things that Hal Prince said up at Harvard when we were there in the fall was that the cold, the, the comfort, even though it was maybe lukewarm as opposed to cold comfort, was that the show that won all the awards was such good work. Uh, Meredith Wilson's The Music Man, if one wanted to write a dissertation about the Broadway stage in 1957, you could take these two shows, two pictures of America, completely different points of view, but both about love. And The Music Man has the advantage over West Side Story in that it's about two grown-ups who are liars, who find that, that they have to drop their lies and live happily ever after. One, a salesman, a traveling salesman, who has lied to every woman that he's had sex with in, the, in all of the counties around uh, River City, Iowa, um, and always escaping the law. And a, a librarian who believes she's smarter and better than everybody and can exist perfectly well uh, with her books. And, uh, and when she falls in love with a liar and he falls in love with the liar, they, as adults, they are both in their 30s, let's say, when that happens. So it's very different from Tony and Maria, who are in their 20s, or maybe even teenagers. Um, I remember as a kid seeing these two shows, and Barbara Cook and Robert Preston were brilliant in that show, and, and, and uh, unforgettable performances, and unforgettable designs, and unforgettable music and lyrics. But now, we, but West Side Story did not get all of those great reviews. It got good reviews. And, and uh, one of the great stories that your father told me, which is really spectacular, uh, one of the, you know, Leonard Bernstein was one of the most honest, disarmingly honest people anybody ever met, and to great embarrassment of many of us at how honest he was. Um, and he told the story of, of walking outside the Winter Garden Theater uh, in, during rehearsals of West Side Story and running into a man 
who came up to me and said, Lenny, how are you? And uh, Lenny said, oh, I'm great. And he said, how's Felicia? Fine, my and Jamie, and the children, and on and on and on. How's the show going? He said, well, we're in rehearsal, and it's going really well. And he said, good, well, lots of luck. And, um, and he walked away, and Lenny had absolutely no idea who he had just talked to. And he said to himself, as he quoted to me, I cannot live my life this way. So he turned around and he ran halfway up Broadway and he said, I'm awfully sorry, I just don't know who you are. And the man said, I'm Walter Kerr. <laughs> now Walter Kerr, for those of you who don't know, was the uh, drama critic of the New York Tribune and the uh, Herald Tribune. And, uh, and so when that review came out, it was a negative one. The price of honesty, but but when, but um, but can can you assess your feelings after that? I know you weren't actually in New York at the, but but in the period after that, about about this question about West Side Story, because there were those who loved it and those who thought that, you know, it had been too arty, too artful, and yet here we are talking about perhaps the most important work of music theater in the 20th century. Well, again, maybe uh, the performers who will speak later can attest to it in a different way. Uh, I remember, I remember being very, very disappointed. I, I couldn't understand it because I knew that West Side was a great work of art. Uh, I mean that it had elevated all the theater arts to an extraordinary degree, and that it wasn't recognized by the theater community was stunning to me. Uh, absolutely stunning. You can and argue, then you shrug your shoulders and say, well, that, that's showbiz. That's showbiz, that's right. But, but you have to understand that in this time, um, <laughs> it was unusual to have a show take place in your time. See, during the 20s and 30s, almost every musical took place in your time. The, the shows of Rogers and Hart all take place the day, the day of the show you're seeing that night. They very rarely took place in the past. There are a few examples that uh, uh, exceptions like Connecticut Yankee, uh, but it always starts in 1936, or it starts in 1924. Rodgers and Hammerstein, however, when they started to work together, began writing shows that took place in other places, places that weren't New York City. So Oklahoma, Carousel is in Maine. You go through that, you get to Allegro, it's a failure. It takes place in the middle of America. South Pacific takes place, obviously, in the South Pacific. The King and I, 1951, we're in, we're in Thailand, we're in Siam. Go through those shows. It's very rare that a show takes place today. And the idea that My Fair Lady takes place in 1912, and The Music Man takes place in 1912, in point of fact, while Henry Higgins is teaching Eliza Doolittle how to speak English, simultaneously, in Mason City or River City, Iowa, is uh, someone called Harold Hill teaching kids the think system to play in a boys, in a boys band. Now, when that's happening all around you, the idea that West Side Story, which actually takes place today, and the people are wearing blue jeans, uh, is, is completely shocking. You, must have, you have to put that into that kind of context of how unbelievably uh, inventive and daring that was. And Leonard Bernstein did say, he, he, I, he said something like, I cannot tell you how many people told me not to waste my time on writing West Side Story. And you also have to remember that the year before West Side Story, Lenny wrote Candide. And Candide was a failure. Great, great work, but it was a failure. And this 1956, and that is the love letter to Europe. One year later, he has achieved his greatest score West Side Story, and I don't think in the history of, of music theater that any composer has ever done that switch within 12 months. One, a European score, a pastiche, a loving, a love letter to Europe and opera and operetta. This is not a, what you'd call an American moment, as it were, in Candide. Whereas then he's writing the work that epitomizes the 50s, New York and America, and becomes the symbol, the musical symbol, Today, still. John, uh, by the way, uh, out of town in Boston, Bells Are Ringing was across the alley from Candide. <laughs> so we kept on going back and forth. 